Hi, good morning. I'm Professor Brenda Elsie. I have some of you as students, but welcome those of you also that are not my students. I'm from the history department and I teach Latin American um, history. I also co-direct the Latin American and Caribbean studies program with Professor San Pedro. There's a lot of cool events back there that the Cultural Center is running. Please take a look at them. Um, you can even go to events that aren't just for classes. It's one of the exciting things um, on campus and sometimes you even meet people people, uh, which is nice. So thank you for coming, and we're going to get started. Sorry for the technical difficulties. Um, I'm really excited to have uh, April Yoder. Dr. April Yoder is associate professor in the history program at University of New Haven. Her research centers on democracy and popular culture, and she teaches history classes on sports and politics centered on the Olympics and various themes relating to Latin America, including race, ethnicity, sports, and drugs and justice. She's published, this is the book she's talking about today. Um, many of my students are, are very familiar with it and did a wonderful job on a quiz earlier this week. Um, but if you're not, um, Pitching for Pitching Democracy, Baseball and Politics in the Dominican Republic was published this year by University of Texas Press. There really is no English language historical monograph on Dominican baseball that has been published in an academic venue. Um, there are bits and pieces of, of academic writing on it, but this is the first one of its kind. So it's very exciting for sports historians like myself um, who have wondered, you know, why isn't anyone coming out with a monograph on Dominican baseball? So um, thank you to Dr. Yoder for that. And since she published this, Pitching Democracy, she's been building her expertise in AI for a new project on democracy, um, AI hype and the responsible tech movement, which sounds like another thing that I would really love to assign. So join me in welcoming her um, to Hofstra. kind of don't want to mess with it because Google's not my, not my usual. I'm going to leave it. Okay, so thank you everyone. I'm really excited to be here. Um, like Dr. Elsie said, I've been changing directions in my, in my research and in my interests, so I don't get to talk about baseball in the Dominican Republic as much as I used to or think about it. So this is a chance to get back into it. Um, and I, nerding out in, about baseball is kind of what I used to do all the time. So it's nice to be back to that. Um, I'm, I created about, or uh, I designed, developed about a 30 minute presentation. So I could leave plenty of time for questions at the end. I hope you have questions for me. Um, maybe I can get some other stories out about um, the Dominican Republic or about baseball during that time. Um, but also, if I lose you at any point, <laughs> don't hesitate to like get my attention and interrupt. I'm also a professor, so I'm used to that. Right? I'm used to being interrupted. I talk all the time in front of people, so you won't mess me up too much. Um, and so rather than recapping what you read in the book and what you were quizzed on, maybe, um, I wanted to talk about more of my research process and how my questions and ideas changed over time, maybe my motivations a little bit. Um, I'm guessing most of you are undergraduates, so you don't have too much experience with big independent research projects. And I wanted to demystify that process a little bit for you and make, I mean, a book is a lot of work, right? But it's not something that I sat down and wrote at one time. And with this idea that I had in my head fully formed, even after I did the book proposal, it, it still needed some, some work. So I, I'm just, I just want to talk about that process a little bit and share some stories and ideas along the way. And yeah, that was the plan to see, so you could see kind of how it changed. Um, and really where I ended up on this question of ownership is, is what I want to come back to at the end, because to me now that's my biggest takeaway from writing the book. It really reshaped how I think about the question of 
who owns Dominican baseball and and what does that look like? And even the definition of what is Dominican baseball is something that changed for me over time. So like I said, it's about the process. So I'm going to talk a little bit about where I started and what got me to go to the Dominican Republic, what I was thinking, how I developed the topic, what I learned on the way specifically as it relates to baseball and democracy, and then democracy and capitalism, but democracy slash baseball together, and then why it matters. So this is a picture of Pedro Martinez, right? in 2004, after the Red Sox won the World Series, they broke the curse. And you see him there with the flag, with the Dominican flag, um, being very proud to be Dominican and of this great achievement. And so sometime around 2005, I don't remember when it was, I was in my friend's kitchen in Topsfield, Massachusetts, um, just outside of Boston. And we were we were talking about my ideas to do a research project on the history of Dominican baseball or baseball and politics in the Dominican Republic. And there, they shared with me a Boston Globe article that had run about Pedro. And it talked about how Pedro Martinez had grown up in relative poverty. It talked about his charity work in, in the Dominican Republic. And that narrative was something that I had seen in other places as I was learning more about Dominicans in Major League Baseball or in, in baseball more generally, the narrative was pretty common that they came from poverty and baseball was an opportunity for economic, and like to improve their economic situation. There was a stereotype that David Ortiz um, had or people said about David Ortiz that he swung at bad pitches and he was always trying to hit a home run because you can't walk off the island. And so that was something in my mind as I went there. And this is uh, an image from Jose Bautista's article in the Players' Tribune a number of years ago. If you can't read this, it says, this is the proposition presented to Dominican families. Have your child give up school at age 12 for a 3% chance to play in the majors. And they do it happily and willingly. And this idea that 3% chance at age 12 is actually much less than 3%. 3% is like after they've already signed a professional contract and are in the academies. But this rags to riches narrative is something that I discovered pretty early on, had been with Dominican baseball players since the first Dominicans made it to the big leagues. Um, the first Dominican big leaguer was Ozzy Virgil in 1956, um, but he had actually signed in the US. He lived in New York for the end of his childhood and had been in the Marines be when he signed. And so, and Felipe Alou, or Felipe Alo. I'm going to say alo and alu because in the DR, they call them alo. In, in the US, they're alu, so it's the same. <laughs> it's the same person. Um, Felipe Alo, when he signed in 1958, there was an article around that time, or in 1960, really, about how he used the money he made from baseball to buy his family a home. Right. So that idea that rags to riches narrative or rags to middle class, what we think of now as middle class, was part of the narrative. The other thing I was interested in was the Cold War. And really, the baseball was a way for me to study what really interested me about the Cold War. And what I knew about the Dominican Republic is that the United States had intervened in a movement to reinstall a democratically elected president in 1965. And that's where I thought my research would center, right? And how maybe I thought Dominicans use baseball to resist or to interact with the occupiers, with the US occupiers or the US OAS, um, OAS's Organization of American States, um, the, the military people who had intervened and were living in the DR. Um, something similar had happened during an earlier US military occupation from 1916 to 1924. So I was like, well, that's a start, 
right? And I thought of baseball maybe as a way of resisting the United States. The U.S., when it intervened or intervenes in Latin America, there's a power differential. The U.S. has more resources, and we think of U.S. dominance and Latin American resistance. That's a pretty common trope. And so I went there with that in mind, but I also wanted to know more about what Dominicans were doing. I was interested in learning about how baseball and politics interacted for Dominicans and what Dominicans did, how they thought of baseball, and how they thought of democracy. So what I learned, um, before my first trip to the Dominican Republic in 2009, my advisor suggested I spend a lot of time looking at newspapers. And I'm so glad he gave me that advice. Um, after reading some... Um, like popular literature about baseball in the Dominican Republic, I learned that Felipe Alo had been fined by Major League Baseball in 1962 for playing in a series that was unauthorized. And he had protested, and they made a, they made a note of this in this write-up about an exhibition about baseball and Dominican identity that had been at a museum in, in Santiago. And I have a map here so I can show you where those are. So that was really interested, interesting to me, and I wanted to learn more. So I started with 1962 for the newspapers. Something else that was going on in 1962 is that there actually was no baseball that winter because the the league, the Dominican Winter League, and the government had decided to not have a series because they were preparing for their first elections in more than 30 years after the dictator Rafael Trujillo was brought to justice. So, so there was, so they had just canceled the season. So Dominicans were going with no baseball for that year. Um, so it seemed kind of a weird place to start my research about baseball in the Dominican Republic in a, a month when there was no baseball. But it turned out to be very motivating because I came across rather early, I came across this cartoon, which is still one of my favorites. And I think it's fully sentimental because when I saw this cartoon, I was like, OK, I have a project. This isn't me just making stuff up. There's, there's a connection here. And so this cartoon came in, I think it's sometime in early October 1962, either as the San Francisco Giants and the New York Yankees were about to begin the World Series, or it was after one of the early games. And it shows, you see Hermanos Aló in, on one arm and Marichal on the other. The Hermanos Aló are Felipe and Mari Alou. And Juan Marichal was um, the um, pitcher for the San Francisco Giants, a, a star. He was the first Dominican actually in the Hall of Fame, but this was long before that. So they were the first Dominicans to play in the World Series. So 1962, the first Dominican made it to the big leagues in 1956, the first Dominicans, and there were three of them in the World Series in 1962. And you can see in this image, they are literally holding the Dominican Republic up high over, I think this is supposed to be Candlestick Park, right? literally raising the country high and that narrative of raising the flag high or raising the country high through athletic performance and athletic achievement was something was a common refrain throughout th throughout time right even for international events like um international baseball games and competitions in the amateur realm they that idea of raising the flag high was was all over the place and part of the reason why national institutions invested in sport and so this cartoon came the day after an editorial had run in the newspaper that talked about baseball and sports more generally as a way to raise the rep the country to raise the people and develop them to make society better. This idea of creating a more perfect society 
or a democratic society was really big, and they saw that potential in baseball. The epitaph, the writing at the bottom of this cartoon, I should have adjusted the cartoon here. I cropped it poorly. But it says um, it called this achievement of Dominicans in the World Series a magnificent inspiration for Dominican youth. So these guys in the Dominican in the United States achieving in baseball was inspirational for Dominicans for generations to come to make democratic society in their country. So I kept seeing as in that first trip, I kept seeing in October November 1962, I kept seeing evidence of baseball and democracy being smushed together, right? They were intertwined. Dominicans conflated the two. This one image is of the president and vice presidential candidates for the PRD, the Partido Revolucionario Dominicano. Um, after they were selected by their party, they're here depicted as a pitcher and a catcher leading the nation. And this other one from late in October or early November, freedom and democracy pitched a no-hitter against communism. So communism had been defeated by freedom and democracy. So it shows where, what Dominicans were thinking at the time about what democracy meant and what it didn't mean. The first round of research also brought me to this image rather quickly. This image is actually from a demonstration during that series that Felipe Alou was fined for playing in. It was a ser an exhibition series between Cubans who exiled Cubans who came from Miami to Santo Domingo to play against Dominican all-stars. And the Cubans were playing because they weren't able to go back to Cuba to play winter baseball because winter baseball was, Castro had prohibited professional baseball the previous year. So basically, if they went back to Cuba, they would be giving up their careers in the United States. And so they played exhibition series to support themselves in the winter and also to raise money for the Cuban freedom cause. I didn't find an explicit connection that they were giving their money from this series to the Cuban freedom cause, but there were some suggestions that it was there. Um, so rather than, rather than criticizing this demonstration or this infiltration of politics onto a baseball field, the editorials and the commentaries around this demonstration hailed it as a, demon, as a sign of Dominican support for their Cuban brothers who were coming to play baseball, and it showed the victory of sport and for democracy. So this, these banners that the youth brought onto the field say, Fidel Castro, murderer, and Cuba will be free. Cuba será libre, or the idea of Cuba libre, is from the independence movement, so it's a shout out or a callback to that as well. So baseball showed Dominicans support and potential for democracy. I saw that coming together in here. And it suggested how democracy would benefit Dominicans economically and otherwise. Can you just explain the K? Yes. So the K is when you, do, when you score in baseball, the K is for a strike. Um, so that's clever, right? It's a clever thing. Um, so yeah, so to me, this showed that Dominicans understood what they wanted from baseball and what they wanted from democracy. And they saw freedom, political freedom. They saw rights, the right to protest, the right to demonstrate, the right to have their voice heard, and economic opportunity like that baseball had provided to their countrymen through democracy. So if I zoom out, 
the early 1960s narratives about democracy in the Americas, including in the United States, John F. Kennedy said these words, right? Talked about democracy as equal opportunity or had this idea of social improvement, the chance to have a better standard of living, as well as political rights and democratic reforms or participation. The th this boiled down to themes of democracy and development. Those were the promises the US made through programs like the Alliance for Progress, initiated in 1961. Um, it was an aid program for Latin American countries to incentivize democratic reforms and to encourage projects for development, for in, to develop industries. But after, in the early 1960s, democracy and democratic reforms up until I would say about 63 with the Cuban Missile Crisis and in the Dominican Republic, 65 was a hard shift toward a really strong emphasis on the development part of that. And government policies started to emphasize development and economic progress specifically over democracy and opportunities then. But still, Dominicans throughout, I saw them maintaining that idea of democracy as opportunity and some economic opportunity for everyone that they that I saw them talk about in the 196 in the early 60s, in 1962. Even after Joaquin Balaguer returned to the presidency in 1966. And I say return because Balaguer had been president under Trujillo during the Trujillo dictatorship. So Rafael Trujillo was a dictator. He was like in charge, but there were presidents who were in the office, had the title until his until he was brought to justice or until he was assassinated. In the Dominican Republic, they call it the ajusticiamiento of Trujillo rather than the assassination. So it's a bringing to justice, not an assassination. Um, so I try to use that word more. Um, so development isn't a bad thing. Development's actually a good thing, right? Um, to raise the standard of living. But the emphasis in the development program became on it became more about industry and developing companies or developing industries at the cost of citizens and rights. So stability is necessary to attract foreign investment and even local investment to make sure that, you know, I'm not going to build a business if I think there's going to be a revolution and it's going to be knocked down tomorrow. So capitalism needs stability, and sometimes that stability in the Dominican Republic came at the cost of the right to protest or the right to organize for better working conditions, the right to strike. So there was the balance shifted right to the economic policies over the rights of the policies to ensure the rights of people. This image is, a, is one that I found from, I think it's from 1976. It might be from 1975. But I'm using it to show how Dominicans continue to fight for economic opportunity and freedom in their democracy. In the book, I talk about the, the balance between in government investment in amateur sport versus professional sport. And amateur sport is where they wanted to encourage that investment because amateur sport was an investment in people. Right, in the development of citizens to create that society that they talked about before. And so in this image, you see this resolution from the, Domini the um, COD is the Dominican Olympic Committee. That's the latter, allowing this rural youth to finally, as he says, eat the fruits of this tree. Um, and that tree is amateur sport. So having the opportunity for citizens to develop themselves through, through sport. OK. In 1975, <laughs> the Cibao Summer League developed. And when I first read about the Cibao Summer League, I 
like I can feel my eyes rolling in memory, right? In muscle memory, because I'm like, oh, it's another professional baseball league that's trying to get money from the government. And I came to realize that it actually represented a new model in what I call in the book a third way, um, a not full capitalism like this singular drive for profit, but it represented kind of a middle way where they were after profit, they were they wanted revenue, they needed revenue to sustain the league, but they were also investing in people and they had restrictions on the number of international players they could recruit to this league. This league was supposed to be to help veteran Dominican players. So the idea of professional baseball with a social purpose actually fits and fit at the time the Dominican context very well. I was excited about the Cibao Summer League once I got over that initial suspicion because it looked like Dominicans were modeling the society they wanted in baseball, right? The Cibao Summer League won government support because they said, hey, we're an industry. We're developing a baseball industry in the Dominican Republic. And so the government gave them money. To, they helped the government invested in stadiums in cities that hadn't had base, professional baseball before. And it won popular support because it offered baseball with real social and economic value. It offered the chance for players or retired players from the United States or even from the Dominican Winter League, the professional league there. It gave them a chance to retrain as coaches or managers and sometimes then go to go on to manage in the US or in other places. And it also offered jobs to stadium workers. They built new stadiums. They needed construction. They needed people to work in the stadiums. They needed umpires. They needed bus drivers. They needed people to make the food, right, concessions. So there was this economic activity around them. And so that won them government support. It legitimated their claims to be an industry. And it also won popular support. A lot of it's PR, right? But it's also what they were doing. <laughs> They were smart to do that. It also offered to prestige to cities that were homes to professional baseball teams for the first time. So this is a map of the Dominican Republic. So you see Santo Domingo, the capital, in the middle. The Cibao Summer League was the Cibao region. I'm going to go here. Um, And yeah, that's where that stuff is. So the Cibao Summer League wasn't, there were teams in Santiago, there were teams in Mao. Um, I think Mocha had for a while La Vega, San Francisco de Macorís, which has a winter league team now. And Puerto Plata was another one where they had a team, the Piratas de Puerto Plata. So why does that matter? So I was left with a problem because I felt like in when I was writing, at least in the dissertation, which was organized differently than the book, I had a moment of hope and promise where Dominicans were, I was excited about it. It was a win, right, for this balance. And then in the next chapter, it would all fall apart, right? They would have an election, be really excited, and then there was a coup up to oust the democratically elected president. They would host this great amateur event, and then this other thing happened. And so I was excited about the Cibao Summer League, at least at first, because Dominicans were shaping baseball and the industry, even, of baseball in their country to align with their democratic ideals. And that was true for at least five years, maybe a decade. And then, and then the Cibao Summer League became a developmental league for players that were signed with US teams. So did they give up? 
And I had to sit with that for a while. And when I wrote the dissertation, I was kind of like, yes. And then all this other stuff happened that's not connected to this story, but it's fun to think about. But then <laughs> I kind of... I kind of realized that I was falling into the same trap that that others had that I that we fall into when we think of baseball as an escape from poverty for Dominican players or that Dominicans are so good at baseball because it's their chance out or off the island. Um, relying on narratives that Major League Baseball colonized Dominican baseball makes us ignore or kind of gloss over what Dominicans are actually doing and how they actually created a center for a global baseball industry in the Dominican Republic. So when we do that, I realized that I was discounting the work of guys like these, like the innovations of guys like these. Um, this is Epi Guerrero on the pitching mound at the inauguration of the National Prospect League, which opened at his complex to honor him. This is in 2012. He actually passed away in 2013. And the other is Ralph Avila, who um, most famously probably signed Pedro Martinez for the, for the Dodgers. And so I learned a lot about baseball and about democracy by looking at newspapers, looking at gov government documents, but I also spent a lot of time with these guys. And the relationship I developed with them and with guys like Jay Alou or Jesus Alo um, really helped me think about how this industry came together. There would be no academy system in the Dominican Republic without these two for sure, because Epi Guerrero actually developed the first academy in the Dominican Republic on his own. And Ralph Avila helped the Dodgers develop theirs about a decade after that. But also these guys were, the, were instrumental in, in creating the league. They, they were part of the group that they were managers. They ran teams in the Cibao Summer League. They oversaw the Cibao Summer League being transferred or being transformed into the Dominican Summer League later. Um, the Dominican Summer League today is the largest minor league in all of affiliated baseball. It oversees hundreds of players and more than 30 teams. That's a huge leap. <clears throat> so while Epi and Ralph profited from the narrative of baseball as an escape from poverty, they also did a lot to work to counter the damage that it did. So where I ended up, and to me, Dominican baseball, it's not Pedro Martinez holding a World Series trophy, though for Red Sox fans, that's really exciting. Um, it's dated now. Um, it's not winter baseball, which is, if you get a chance to go see a winter baseball game, definitely do it. It's awesome. It's amazing. It's so fun. Um, it's like pure baseball, but really fun as well. Um, I don't have a lot of that here, but it's definitely in the book. Um, those are part of it. But Dominican baseball is the work of scouts like Epi. This is Epi when he was much younger than when I knew him. It's the little leaguers, like those here who show up every day to play and like really play. It's baseball, it's a game, they're playing. And here they also show some gringos how to play Batia. This is a summer program that I used to teach with CIEE in Santo Domingo. Baseball in the Dominican Republic is about history and pride and guys like these, like these are the Alou brothers, um, who devoted their whole lives to baseball. They played baseball as long as they could. They managed teams in various iterations. They made baseball accommodate Dominicans in a way that I don't think even I fully understand, right? They were instrumental in making baseball Dominican, and that includes Major League Baseball. Um, Jay Alou, for example, uh, ran the Red Sox Academy in the Dominican Republic for a number of years. He passed away a year or two ago. 
And he had been out of that job for only a year or two before he passed away. So he did that for a really long time. And he was also a scout for a long time before that. Um, It's also Dominicans who lined the streets to welcome these guys back from their World Baseball Classic Series in 2013. And it's about democracy and it's about capitalism, industry and development, but it's also about history and pride and the meaning they make out of life. That's it. Thank you. Is this already on? No? Do I even need it? Yeah, it's on. It's on? It's oh, on cool. Thank you so much. Um, that was lovely. And we've left a lot of time for questions. I would prefer it's um, not me and students starting. If you have any, um, no question, too small, too big. Um, yeah, yeah. Can I take this off? Can I walk? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I just being yeah. behind things. <laughs> OK. Oh. Hi, um, Hi. Thank you for coming. Um, I'm also a big baseball nerd. Um, I'm also from the Dominican Republic as well. Um, so I'm currently doing an independent study um, on the Cuban defection stories from Cuban baseball players. Um, so I wanted to ask you just how was your process like, and did you have an idea of what you were trying to look for, or did everything just come to you after you started researching? I started with a question, right? And at first, my question was really, like, are baseball and politics in the Dominican Republic connected? And based on the secondary stuff that I had read, um, Rob Ruck has a book, The Topic of Baseball, um, which is more popular, but there he had some suggestions you know, of where, like, Trujillo was involved in baseball. And I was like, okay. So I know that he at least had his hands in baseball at some point, but what did it look like later? And so I hadn't, I knew, I started with a question. So I was just looking for examples of where baseball could be intertwined with politics, and I found that in the the democracy stuff. And I don't, I think it's pretty blatant, right? I don't think I'm taking too many liberties in in coming up with that interpretation. But that's, um, yeah, you just start with a question and and see what comes. If you, I had an idea that I, again, that I would find something with Trujillo. When I looked at the government documents, once I got a sense of what the different presidents were like, I had a sense of kind of what I might find in different, in different, during different governments, but also in um, doing archival research, you're kind of at the mercy of the people in the archive. So they would bring me these huge boxes, and in the box, it was just everything from the Secretary of Sport, and some boxes would have like 1937 and 1995, right? So there's not necessarily... It, it took a while to kind of piece it together. So I have a follow-up, yep. actually, to that. Did you do chronological order, or did you just order it however you saw fit? For the book? Yeah. Um, it was mostly chronological. So I, what, I, what made sense <laughs> at the time, and I think this happens a lot in history, that chronological seems to make sense because we want to show the change over time. How did we get from here to there? And for me, I broke it in the dissertation, which is like the first draft for the book and the shortened draft. The dissertation only went to 78. This book goes all the way to uh, 2018-ish. Not a lot of digging on 2018, but um, the archival records were very slim after the 70s. Um, There was 
really after the 80s, they got very slim. And I was looking for, what I was really looking for and never found was evidence of Epi buying the land that he bought and building his complex and also of the Dodgers building Campo Las Palmas. Mm -hmm. And I didn't find it Um, because I know, I know there were tax incentives and I know that the academies in Boca Chica now, I know their stuff. I know the government is giving them money, um, but I, I can't find it. So the, the order came from what was there, the way that it made sense to tell the story. And because otherwise there wasn't a thread and it's really about storytelling and yeah. Uh, one, one, yeah. one, one more. Um, you have any recommendations for me? Any tips, tricks um, as I go into the la- final stages, really, of my of my research with the Cuban um, defection stories? The cu- so you're starting in the nineties. <laughs> <laughs> I'm or starting from Fidel all the way down. Okay, so starting with Fidel, if you do. Um, because I, I have, so what I'm focusing on now that I've already had uh, a lit review, I already did uh, a method, I already have a method of rhetorical analysis. Um, all I'm doing is now uh, uh, taking the stories of uh, current or past baseball players such as Yasiel Puig, um, the Yuli, um, Guriel brothers, like some of the current uh, mm-hmm. C- Cuban baseball players, I'm putting that together. So okay. when it comes to the stories, um, how would you recommend me going by it? It depends, right? It depends. Are you, you could make it about if they have, if you're, if you could think of, excuse me, if you think of each of the players as kind of a story, that could be a way if they're, if they have certain differences and you want to highlight their different experiences, you could center it on the, on the players. Um, You could also look at compare and contrast maybe how, Yasiel Pui came in the 2000s or the Guriel brothers. Well, even the Guriel brothers came, have come since relations have improved, yeah. although... Right. Yeah, they... Right. Like, yeah. there are there yeah. are Cubans now in the Dominican academies, mm-hmm. or at least the, I haven't been there since 2017, but they were there in 2017. Mm-hmm. So, I don't... Trump kind of messed that up a little bit but I think probably not as much as he could have um the or not it didn't go it didn't take maybe um but yeah so that's that's a story right and those are those are comparisons and contrasts versus like a a Liban Hernandez or or someone and I know that there's a lot about Liban Hernandez and his brother Mm -hmm. or his stepbrother um but yeah that's like 90s if you go back to the 60s you can talk about guys like Tony Perez yeah who were here Mm -hmm. basically they chose they had to choose yeah um there's a great documentary by PBS called I think it's called The Lost Son of Havana yeah uh, with Louis Tian Louis Tian yeah I have um, that one in the archives okay yeah. so that's another story so yeah I would say for organizing it it's up to you what makes sense yeah. given the evidence that you have what how do you want to tell your story what story makes sense to tell thank you so much you're welcome thank you Thank you. Yes, questions. Yeah, I, I mean, we're applauding the questions. Yes, yeah. yes. Other people? Yeah. Yes. Do you want to, can you go? Sure. Uh, should we bring it around? I, I can, can just say it here. Or yeah, second. just so they can hear you. Yeah. I was going to ask, why was professional baseball banned in Cuba? <laughs> because they call it pelota esclava, because capitalism is enslaving people. And so... In 1962, Fidel Castro, the the revolution in Cuba was explicitly communist or explicitly socialist. And so part of the reverberations of that was getting rid of professional baseball because professional baseball was about creating this spectacle with sport. It was about paying people to, you know, in this industry rather than about developing people, which is what sport was. 
And so in narratives about Cuba and Cuba investment in sport, there's, there's a lot, right? There's a lot about the amateur professional divide. And so the idea is that amateur sport is where, you know, like why we all take PE in elementary school, right? Because sport is good for you. It, it develops your mind and your body. And these ideas go back to like at least the 19th century. So amateur sport was to help develop the Cuban people for Cuba, to make Cuba better, to make them better. Whereas professional sport kind of took the top and made it a spectacle. So it was, it was ideological <laughs> um, and it was part of the revolution. So they, they distinguished pelota revolucionaria from pelota esclava. Pelota esclava was professional baseball. Revolution, revolutionary baseball is like the national series that they have now, which is basically professional baseball in Cuba <laughs> for Cuba. Other questions? Good. There was a methodological one more. Um, since you sort of took us through your questions and your explorations and how, which is so great, and it's the anatomy of a research project, which we don't often get to hear about. We usually get the final bits. But um, sort of as a continuation of our discussion earlier, what was it like being a woman in this very male world, it seems to me I'm not a Latin Americanist, but um, you know what? What can you share some of that experience with us? Yeah, thank you. That's actually I get that question, or I used to get that question all the time. What are you doing studying baseball, <laughs> right? Or how did you decide on to study baseball? And there's like the kind of flippant answer and anti-feminist answer is I was dating a baseball player. Um, I was dating a minor league baseball player. Actually, when I was doing my master's at the University of Arizona um, I in Tucson, where there are, um, where some, some of the teams do their spring training, I had met this baseball player and was dating him. And I showed up for a class with Bill Beasley with a sunburn. <laughs> because So Bill Beasley... Um, does popular culture in Mexico, or he studies popular culture in Mexico. And I showed up to his class with a sunburn and said, you know, I had been at the spring training game watching this guy that I was dating. And he's, okay. He didn't say anything. But then when I defended my thesis with him, um, with Beasley, he's like, after the thesis, he's like, April, you know, like, education in Nicaragua during about the revolution is like great and everything but you should study baseball and I'm like no that's his thing and he gave me this book about Latin Latin baseball players and I was like oh okay like I read it I was like okay maybe and then you know the Pedro Martinez story so so that's how I got to baseball it's I'm kind of embarrassed about the, the connection, but I learned, I dated this guy for five years. Um, I learned a lot about baseball. Um, I, I, got, I got demonstrations of what a bulk looks like. I, I, he ended up working, he's like a vice president with the Red Sox now, um, and so he ended up working in the front office after he left, so I saw the baseball industry in all its different Ways so I understood the way baseball works, and that experience was invaluable when I went to do my research because I, I kind of knew questions to ask that I wouldn't have known otherwise. And um, so when I got to the DR, what it was actually like um, is I would show up, and JLU was actually one of my favorite, it wasn't as bad as I thought it would be because I thought they would just dismiss me. And maybe some of them did because they're like, 
they like wouldn't answer my call or whatever. But um, one of the first, the first interview that I did was actually with Moises Salo, or what's he called? What's his name in English? Moises Salou. He he played with the Cubs. In the 90s, he's, he's Felipe Alou's son. He's, so the, um, the Cubs story when, what's his name, Be- Beckham, Bartman, Steve Bartman, like, interfered with the play and they lost the World Series. Um, that Moises was the one who was going to catch the ball. And so my first interview was actually with him. Um, and... And he led me, I think he led me to some other people. Um, I think I got Jay because of him. And Jesus, I don't, like they entertained me. And I think the fact that I was at Georgetown, that carried some weight. I'm a PhD student at this university that had some prestige. But I think also I just kind of played dumb a lot. And I let that work for me. It's not, you know, like, I wanted them to talk to me, so I would just, you know, okay, so tell me about this. And sometimes they, sometimes interviews, like, with with, uh, radio guys, like broadcasters, sometimes they would explain too much to me. Like, no, 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 like, I, I know. Um, but I would just kind of let them talk. And so in some ways that worked for me. Um, I was uncomfortable at times at the academies and stuff, but people were pretty protective, especially anybody affiliated with Major League Baseball there is very conscious of the differences. And so um, like the first academy I went to was the Mets Academy and Juan Henderson was the administrator and he took me around and nobody said anything to me. I was much younger then. So um, I think they would, they reacted to me differently than, than they would now. But Juan Henderson kind of helped me out through that and they were very respectful. And then I was mostly talking to old men in their 70s and 80s about their glory days, right? And so that was a lot of fun, and I think they just welcomed the opportunity to talk about it. And so, yeah, like, they would tell me things that I already knew, but they would often go further. One time, Jay actually, or often, like, he would be talking, he'd be like, oh, you already know that. I'm like, no, tell me, tell me, because you tell me something different you know, it leads to somewhere else. So I don't know, he was really interesting about, about that dynamic too. Sorry, a long answer. <laughs> Other questions? Yeah. Do you want to come? I don't want to cross. <laughs> uh, uh, hello. I recently, I think last night I came across the Parsley Massacre in the, the Dominican Republic. I didn't really get too into depth. Do you have any more information on that? So my friend Sabine Cado wrote a, an award-winning book about it um, that came out last year, the year before. Um, it's really expensive, though. Your library probably has it. I'm trying to remember what it was called. I think it's called no, More Than a Massacre. But the Parsley Massacre was during the Trujillo dictatorship, and it actually happened in 1937, which was the same year they spent... They basically bankrupted professional baseball for a number of years in the DR because they recruited, they showed up to Satchel Page with a briefcase of money or with, you know, like a suitcase full of money and said, recruit a team to play in the DR so that this team in Santo Domingo wins in the name, or Ciudad Trujillo wins in this series. Um, So I think that baseball series happened in part to hide what was going on with the Parsley Massacre, but I don't know a lot about it. I know that um, it's, what else, what do you want to know about it? Anything in particular? No, just anything. Well, maybe I can ask a related question yeah. that brings it to baseball, okay. too, which I told you I was going to ask. Yes. Um, because we 
have studied, you know, Dominican-Haitian relations a bit, mm -hmm. um, but not that often. How do you see um, baseball in the Dominican Republic in terms of its I racial identity and ideas about race? Yeah, that's that's tricky, and there are a lot of it's it's always changing also so um there's this idea in the dominican republic lately and when we look at the dr from afar you're like oh dominicans hate haitians and it's because they deny their blackness that's a common narrative that scholars now are unraveling and pushing against because it's not that simple um Dominicans in the Dominican Republic understand, especially now because ideas about race from the U.S. are infiltrating the Dominican Republic as well, is a lot of them identify also as black and versus like Dominican or Indio. But the, so Trujillo attacked, used the Haitians as a scapegoat and they as a scapegoat for economic problems and to explain problems in the DR. And that kind of put a target on them that has been, you know, it was repeated by Balaguer, it was repeated by others in power. And trying to think of how to shift. And, and it still exists. It's still a problem in the DR. And there was... In the last 10 years, there was a, uh, it's called La Sentencia, and they changed also the Constitution so that people born in the Dominican Republic of Haitian parents aren't considered Dominican. Be they don't have Dominican citizenship by birth. They have to like apply for it. So it basically stripped people of their nationality, which is a violation of their human rights. But they, um, in baseball, we saw we see problems with cases like Miguel Anjo, or Miguel Sano, who had trouble. The um, documentary Pelotero or ball player Pelotero um, talks about his journey to getting signed, and he, it cost him millions of dollars, like literally millions, probably three million dollars on a signing bonus because there was an investigation and it came back that they couldn't confirm his identity. They couldn't say for 100% that he was who he said he was. They said his age was probably right, but they couldn't confirm that he was like his parents' child or something crazy. And it's in part because of the documentation because probably his mother was not fully documented from Haiti and so there are, it's not even necessarily about race in baseball. It's about nationality and status. And so if they can't confirm his identity, though, he can't get a visa to come to the U.S. And so that creates problems and lost opportunities and lost money for prospective players. So like things like the Sentencia, which are grounded in race and this idea of the overlap of nationality and race is um, <laughs> has has those economic consequences for people because maybe you know a kid uh, somebody will try to the Red Sox will try to sign somebody who's 16. And they want him to go straight to Florida for spring training, but then they find out he can't get a visa because they can't confirm his identity because of the legal... Like, he doesn't have papers as a Dominican, so he would have to go to Haiti to, like, make up documents for being born in the DR, but no one's doing anything like that in Haiti right now. <laughs> so... Um, so what does that kid do? He can't get a passport. So um, it's not about baseball. <laughs> it's about, I mean, there are Haitian Dominican kids or Dominican kids of Haitian descent who are playing baseball and who are going to be in Major League Baseball. I mean, Sano is one. 
and there are Pierre's and Jean's and people of Haitian descent already already there. Um, so it's happening. Hi. Um, so my brother plays baseball. He's been playing literally since he was like eight years old. So that's how I spend a lot of my time. And one thing I've noticed a lot, especially recently as he's gotten older, um, is especially even like in like youth sports, he does a lot of like travel ball. He plays for a national team right now. Um, and they play a lot of team like youth teams from the Dominican Republic. And uh, there's kind of a weird dynamic now where it seems like a lot of the American teams almost look up to the Dominican youth teams because they're almost kind of on, like, I guess this other level to them. Um, and I wondered if, like, you had any commentary or, like, kind of how that dynamic came to be, even though, like, they're all kind of the same age and everything. Yeah. How old are they? Um, like 15, 16 right now. Yeah. So the teams are probably like that National Prospect League where – so when Dominican boys – are around 12, like Little League runs out. And there are no travel leagues like we have here in the Dominican Republic. Like if there aren't, yeah, it just doesn't exist, right? People can't pay thousands of dollars for their kid to, to do that, or most of, most of people can't in the DR. So they, um, so often what they do is that the best players will sign with an independent trainer and the independent trainers, there are various versions of independent trainers. Uh, one guy I know, um, Daniel and Mano Guayabo, who actually where that picture of the Little Leaguers was taken, he works as an independent trainer. And it's just on his field, which is like a public field in the middle of no, or, you know, in this t sub town outside of Santo Domingo, and he just works with them one-on-one. -on -one. And there are also elaborate um, Bartolo Colon. Do you guys know who that is? He's a little bit older. Um, he also has an academy where he has, like, a legit stadium and, and a weight room where he works out. I mean, he was training. I have a picture actually of him there where, and he was in there working out when he was getting ready to come back for, I think it was his last season when he went to, was it the Rangers? Um, and, and so it's this nice, more professionalized thing. So some of the independent trainers will have teams. And so these guys are devote are, basically professional baseball players. They're not getting paid yet, but they're playing. They're at this academy away. Often they're staying in dorms and their lives are like, they wake up, they have practice, they eat, they have practice. They maybe have some breaks. They maybe give them time to go to school or take their classes, maybe. Um, they may or may not do that, <laughs> and then they, and then they play baseball again. So it's it's different. It's more focused. Um, whereas, yeah, it. I mean, it depends on who they're playing too, but it's not guys who do it on the weekends or even a couple hours a day after school. It's more professionalized. So I think, yeah, maybe that's why they seem, if they seem good. It's actually, this is actually another innovation, right? So the independent trainers used to just give them lessons. So what the scouts, the MLB scouts were finding is that the the players from the Dominican Republic would do great at the showcases. Like their skills indiv individually were great. They were really strong. They had the fundamentals, whatever. But then when they put them in a game, they didn't have the instincts. That comes from playing in like a travel league and just playing, you know, hundreds of games a year. 
And so they, or even tens of games a year. And so that's kind of where the DSL came from um, and how, why the academies play the games against each other. And that just um, went down also. It filtered down to the lower levels, to the independent trainers, where they basically create the system that we have with travel teams in the U.S. They basically created that among themselves outside of there. So you're welcome. Another question, and I, you know, I'm really interested about this, the the sort of communist critique of capitalist sport, and, and there was a really similar critique. At, like I work on arts and France, so not, very far away from this, but there was a critique in the late 19th, early 20th century about. Um, uh, that had to do with professional arts. And, you know, that was basically, you know, just a capitalist ploy. And that really we wanted community arts. We want community centers. We want cultural centers. We want performances done by people who live in the neighborhood. And we want to empower regular folks, right, through, through art making. And that that tension actually has continued, right, until right today, <laughs> um, this tension between community art making and professional arts. Um, and I'm wondering if, in, if, it, if that's true in the sports world as well. Like for me, it makes a lot of sense that folks would want to empower you know, neighborhood, school-based athletics and teams as opposed to pouring all this energy into the less than 3% of people who are going to make it into a professional setting. So I'm just curious about this tension because I think it's it certainly continues. I mean even even ASO like American Youth Soccer Organization versus the travel leagues uh, or the pre-Olympic uh, training and you know that kids who just want to play soccer for fun as opposed to those who are like trying to get on the team for their college and the whole it's it's part of the whole issue. They kind of run out of opportunities to play, just play soccer for fun as they get older, right? Like, until they get, until they, old, get, until they get much older, like in their twenties and older, and can do like the, the bar leagues, or you know, like, yeah. Um, so what I saw in the Dominican Republic is, I. It feels like in baseball, everybody wants to see all the baseball as, well, I came to see all of baseball as part of this larger system. And there are kids, I think, who play baseball just for fun, but I think there's that idea in the back of their head that they should be playing it. Um, I This is just a guess. Um, in Dominicans from the higher classes or who are more socially or economically comfortable, I it seemed like they were less likely to play baseball because baseball has kind of lost that fun. It, it became, they see it as something the less advantage people do to try to make it to the big leagues and they'll play soccer. So rec soccer is growing in the Dominican Republic, and I think it's, I think it's a class thing. I haven't, it's just a guess, right? It's just an idea that I have that I'm not going to investigate <laughs> further. I'm going to see what happens. But um, I think that, oh, it's so complicated now too because it's also about getting into college. So I'm listening to this book about parenting and, <laughs> Um, no, they talk about cultivating, like middle-class parenting is now about cultivating your kids and giving them every opportunity and how we overschedule kids to, so that they can get into a good college or get a college scholarship. And so it's not, I mean, it is different, but is it that different from, from what's happening in the Dominican Republic? It's a different of degree, maybe. Um, I, that 
is not the communist critique, but it, it is in some, in some ways. Like if we had more funding for college and everyone really could go to college, um, maybe we won't have to worry about that so much. So mm -hmm. it's all it's all connected. <laughs> yeah. Other questions? We have time for another. While you're thinking, can I add one thing on the Cuba? The yes. On yes. the Cuban case. Yes. So, which goes to your paper a little bit and your question. Um, when Cuba deprofessionalized baseball, it was not really Fidel's choice, it wasn't really his plan. When Fidel comes into power, it's many of the Afro Cubans who had played for the Negro Leagues who came back and said, we do not want to mock what's going on in the United States. It is reproducing, you know, exploitation of bodies, of black bodies. We have, you know, seen how they treat us, how owners treat us, et cetera. So there's a real anti-racist discourse that happens between 1960 and 61. It's people like Martin Diego, who run Inder for a while in Cuba, who played in the Dominican leagues, in the Puerto Rican leagues, in the Mexican leagues, um, and comes back to Cuba and says, amateurism is the only way to get rid of racism as well. So just, just what? I mean, that's my new book, no, right? That's, that's interesting because of the, um, it's interesting because of the like pushback against anti-racism in the revolution, at least more recently, mm -hmm. where they're, to be revolutionary, you first have to be, revolutionary will deal with that race stuff later or racism isn't a problem anymore because mm -hmm. of the revolution so that's that's a moment it's right a moment. it's those one of those moments of opportunity where you're like yes they're gonna make the world better and then something happens yeah but, I mean like, I, I don't know I, I don't I, I think they do. I, you saw you had Tommy Lasorda up there, who's one of the main proponents for ostracizing Cuba because he had to leave Cuba and he claimed he was being shot and stuff, which is complete bullshit. So um, just know that Tommy Lasorda is a very conservative anti-Cuban <laughs> figure. Um, I think it's a, I think it's so great when you talk about this moment and their connection just to go back to 60, the early 60s as this kind of time when all of this was up in the air. And so I think you're right to say it's a moment and it shuts down at certain points because Cubans have to deal with the international market. And that international market is willing to take someone like Tony Perez and um, take a union leader and make him into a celebrity that has no social conscience. And um, you can say that that's fine. That's his choice, right? Self-care. Put on his oxygen mask. But um, he really left a lot of people um, in Cuba who were depending on him. And so I do think that those arguments are very painful for Cuban players, and I don't mean to like dismiss them <laughs> in any way. But this idea that f this came down from Fidel, in many ways I love your point that we're ignoring what a whole bunch of Dominicans, their initiative and their um, kind of um, innovation. And this really came from Cuban players. This did not, Fidel does not, there's no evidence that Fidel walks in in 1959 and cares one hoot about baseball. That's a story. And he actually, yes. I mean, that's two years, right? Mm -hmm. They were the Havana Sugar Kings in... Like, they didn't leave until, was it 1961, or officially? And, like, they were trying to make Cuba part of basically tr uh, AAA, right? They were trying to make the internationally go through Cuba and with the idea that eventually there would be a major league team there. And so, yes, I have a simplistic understanding of that. What was happening, I haven't been able to dig into it, but... So professional baseball was cut out. But I think some of it was responding to what was happening from the, like the Sugar Kings actually decided to leave. I think that caused him to move forward as much as, mm -hmm. as ideology. But yes, that's a better answer to your question. 
than I had. <laughs> but <laughs> no, <laughs> yes, but but that is like a that's a more nuanced answer. I was giving the the simplistic answer. Yes. We have time for one more question, probably. Um, but we are close to 12.45, so, I, you know, we, should, we could also just say thank you to Dr. Yoder. Thank you yes. very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. This is wonderful.